Good afternoon and welcome to the March 15th in Guantanamo, Birmingham. Uh, real special thanks to Michael Leeds and the students from ASPA for performing here today. Let's give them a round of applause. Wonderful way to start a lunch. Uh, so please stand as I invite Shannon Miller to the podium to offer the invitation and lead us to the pledge of Today, please, everyone, think and keep in your hearts and minds those uh, Alabamians who suffered from the tornado. Bow your heads. Let us turn to the source of spiritual strength that is within each of us and pray. May those of us who have share with those who have not. May those of us who can do for those who cannot. May those of us who are loved love those who are not. And may we all live our lives so that the world is better off for having had us. Amen. <laughs> Lots of ways to sign up. 
Uh, but please, we'd love to have you there. It's going to be a terrific event. We have a ton of guests this week, and we are not going to introduce everyone by name, but I do want to recognize, uh, as uh, what I'm going to ask the guests and hosts to do is all stand up in a second, uh, but I just do want to recognize all the great folks from Willis Tower Watson who are here today. A uh, special round of applause for all of our guests, so if our guests and hosts can stand up. And please welcome them. And last but not least, Michael Meeks wanted to share that the first uh, round of the symphony, uh, the students playing the symphony were eighth graders. Uh, so, uh, and then the last round, the second round, were all high school kids. So I suppose there are some pretty talented people over at ASPA. Thanks for doing that, Michael. Uh, yeah, no, sorry, I'll go to Fred's Thank you, sure. Uh, yeah, that was really great. Uh, so again, thanks to JW and welcome to all of our guests here today. Uh, and what a great crowd, so uh, glad to have you here. Uh, our thoughts and prayers should go out to our fellow Alabamians, uh, as Shannon mentioned, uh, impacted by the tornadoes on, on Sunday. Uh, also, as JW mentioned, don't forget, you know, come and have a cup of coffee with fellow Alabamians tomorrow or later, starting at 7 a.m. Um, also, get a little bit out, out of order here and just emphasize a really, uh, as you see on the bookmark here, a really fantastic lineup of speakers that uh, Richard and Tyler continue to uh, line up for us. So please come, uh, keep coming, uh, remind other clients as you see them to, to come. We've got just fantastic speakers coming up in the hat. I mean, we're going to get you here by Lyft or Uber, right? That's so they, uh, so uh, thanks for being here. Uh, also, I had the pleasure of spending some time with our speaker this morning. I think you're really going to find this a timely topic and uh, you're going to enjoy it. So looking forward to hearing from him. We also have a new member introduction today. Uh, as Scott Russell and the membership committee continue their outstanding work. So I'd like to call Tyler O'Connor to the podium to introduce new member Ben Chappell. Thank you, President Scott. Along with Kiwanis sponsors Albert Finch, Brad Baker, Philip Curry, and Jim Ward, I'm very pleased to introduce Ben Chapel as the newest member of the world's best Kiwanis Club. Ben is the founder and president of Interior Elements. He operates and manages the company throughout a six state footprint. Ben has formed one of the largest commercial interior design and contract furniture dealerships in the Southeast. By merging a, a rep group, we founded Jim Birmingham with Interior Elements of Mississippi, and then ex expanding into Tennessee, Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina. Employing a model unique to their industry, Ben and his team have planned and executed the interior packages for some of the most prestigious corporate, healthcare, education, educational, and governmental institutions in the nation. Ben currently serves on numerous professional boards. In 2017, he was inducted into the Board of Directors for the Auburn University Alumni Association. And he has since served in various leadership roles there. Ben also served as a member of the Advisory Board of Directors of the Auburn University School of Commercial Interior Design, which is the top accredited commercial interior design program in the United States. In 2018, Ben was appointed to serve on the Advisory Board of Directors for Oak World Capital Bank here in Birmingham. Ben grew up in Columbia, South Carolina, and after earning a bachelor's degree in finance, became the third generation of all university graduates in his family. Ben also received an executive MBA from the Auburn University Raymond J. Harvard College of Business. In 2015, Ben was the exclusive recipient of the prestigious Auburn University Young Alumni Achievement Award, which recognizes nationally Auburn's most outstanding young alumnus under the age of 40. Ben loves the outdoors, and his leadership and athleticism have led Ben to be actively involved in establishing and growing the Birmingham chapter of F3, a men's workout group dedicated to promoting male leadership through fitness, fellowship, and faith. In two years' time, some 700 men have become involved in this group. There are seven of us in the room today. Ben is married to the former Anna, Anna Donaldson of Jasper, Alabama, and some of you may remember Anna from her time as an anchor and reporter for the CBS Morning News program, Wake Up Alabama. 
The chapels currently reside at Homewood with their three children, Elizabeth, John, and Catherine, and they're expecting their fourth literally any day now. Um, I'm very pleased as well as a guest today to have Mr. Jeff Donaldson. Jeff, would you mind staying? Jeff is Ben's father-in-law and is the distinguished past president of the Jasper Wines Club and wine for nearly 50 years. So I'm very glad to have you today. I'm very fortunate to have Ben as a leader here in Birmingham and it is my honor to help welcome him to the Wines Club Birmingham. And welcome Ben to the club. Let you quickly engage with one of our committees so we can get you further acclimated to the club. So All right, on to the program. So uh, Tyler O'Connor, co-chair of our programs committee, doing an awesome job with that. Broker CRC Insurance Services, Kauai since 2015. Ben Chapel, new member just introduced by, by Tyler. Uh, Mike Carlson, EBP and Deputy General Counsel. BDPA Compass, audience has been a member of 2018. Please stand. Um, Sam Heidi, Principal Wicker Park Capital Management, Quantian since September 2017. J.W. Carpenter, Executive Director, of Birmingham Education Foundation, Quantian since 2013. Shannon Miller, Shannon, thanks again for your invitation. Co Chair, Youth of the Year Committee. Attorney Jackson Lewis, LLP, Kauaian since 2012. And finally, Richard Meadows, the other co-chair of our programs committee. Thank you again for all of your work, Richard. Director of Health and Benefits, Willis Towers Watson. Richard has the honor of introducing our speaker today. Please join me in recognizing the head table. So I called her, I called her last night and said, Sherry, I'm on my way down to Birmingham. 
heading down south to talk to the Kiwanis Club. And uh, she's like, there's no Kiwanis Club in the south like that. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, well, the Birmingham's north of I-10. You're not going to the south at all. And so I was explaining to her that I was going to get some good barbecue and some good fried chicken. It was a lost cause, so I just, uh, we just went with that. But I'm really happy to be here today. You know, as, um, as Richard said and as Scott said, I'm going to spend just a couple minutes here talking about the future. And you know, a lot of people talk about the future of technology, the future of telecommunications, the future of human resources and people. I'll tell you, I'm going to talk to you for a couple minutes about how I think the future is actually here now. I think we are actually living in the future, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what companies are doing about it around the world because the future is pretty unpredictable. And, you know, there's a lot of changes going on right now. As we can see, you know, Wall Street's confused, Main Street's confused, and we all want to know what to do. And, you know, just when we think about today being the future, a couple of facts for you. First, Facebook what became the world's largest country last year. There are more people on Facebook than there are in China. But this year, Facebook has taken over more countries. There are now more people on Facebook than in China, the US, Japan, Germany, UK, France, South Korea, Canada, Poland, Malaysia, the Netherlands, and Australia all put together, right? So they're going to have to go for Mars next because they're going to run out of people. But we're living in a world where people are technology enabled. The number of text messages sent and received in one day it seems three times the population of the planet. That's just in my house with two teenage boys. <laughs> who, by the way, zero minutes of talk time. The, the boys don't need phones, they just need text, because they don't talk, but they text up a storm, right? That's the workforce that's coming up today. My 14-year-old had his birthday party last Sunday. I should have brought the picture. There's eight of them laying on the floor all on their phones, right? That's what a birthday party looks like these days. But they weren't being antisocial. They were playing this game that hundreds of kids were also playing that Saturday night. So they're being social. They're just being social different ways than we're used to. Now, as we get to the business side of things, the number of jobs created for everyone lost due to the internet was 2.6. Everybody goes around talking about how the internet was a job loser. The internet was actually a job gainer. For every person who lost his or her job because of the internet, 2.6 people lost their, sorry, got jobs. Same thing for robotics. Everybody's talking about robotics today as a job loser. Robotics is a job gainer because someone's got to design that robot, build that robot, ship that robot, assemble that robot, program that robot, and then service that robot, and then reprogram it when it tries to take over the world. That's a lot of people. But you never hear about the ones who got jobs from this. You're only hearing about people who lost jobs. Right? That's a lot of the social tension we're having today in developed countries. I was in, I was in London a couple weeks ago. They got Brexit problems like we never believe over here because there's this rift between people with the new skills and people with the old skills. How do you bring them together in a way that's good for society and that's good for the business community? That's what companies are asking today. Because the number of freelance workers in the US is increasing every day. Um, so, you know, we already have today 36% of our population as freelancers. And by 2020, the number is going to be 43%, and the number is going to cross over and be more than half our workforce freelancers by 2027. So we ask ourselves what do we do in a society? where the primary unit of work is going to be done by people who don't actually work for the companies as employees. How do we have to set up all of our systems, all of our health care, all of our retirement, our compensation, our benefits? How do we do that? That's a big question facing companies today. At the same time, though, these, these freelancers have an advantage because they are reskilling at twice the rate of other groups. They are reskilling over half of them each year. And so that's, that's a pretty big difference. How do we keep up? How do we have our own employees keep up with those outsider walls? That's a big question. And how do we make our companies attractive 
for these people who have options, who can go on their phones and get work an hour here, three hours there, whatever they want. How do we, how do we as a society change? So, you know, we talked about lifts and Ubers to get here. Well, imagine if your job was like that. You could go online and find a job on your phone. That's what's happening. At the same time, we're having a huge generational shift. Baby boomers are retiring in this country at the rate of one every nine seconds between now and 2029. I usually lose a few people from each room I'm in you know, during these kind of conversations. And people are like, oh, I better take mine. Because the baby boomers are retiring fast. And a lot of wisdom is walking out the door with that. At the same time, Generation X, which is the next generation coming along, now occupies more than half the leadership roles globally. This kind of amazes people, because a lot of people think about Generation X, if any of you saw the TV show Friends 20 years ago, right, Ross and Rachel and Phoebe, they were all Gen X, and people are like, well, wait a minute, weren't those the Gen Xers? I'm like, yeah, Ross and Rachel are 52, and Phoebe's 58. Phoebe's almost ready to retire already, and people can't believe that somehow <laughs> this tiny generation of Generation X came along, and now is in leadership roles, but they're a small generation. I'll show this in a second. So what's going on is there are not enough Gen Xers to replace the baby boomers who are retiring from companies. Meanwhile, you've heard a lot about millennials. Millennials are the largest generation in the US workforce today. Uh, more than one in three workers in the US today are millennials. They, they are the ones who are the dominant population in companies and will be for some time. The problem is a lot of companies have not figured out how to absorb the younger generations yet. And just when they start figuring it out, along comes a new generation called Generation Z, uh, my kids, who are entering the workforce in large numbers. The problem is Generation Z is another tiny generation. Think about it. Baby boomers, big generation. Their kids, millennials, big generation. Gen X, small generation, their kids, Gen Z, small generation. So now we're having this compression that there are no longer enough workers at entry level either. And half of them are operating as freelancers. So we just don't have enough talent to replace the people who are progressing. So for the first time in 40 years, we have talent shortages at the top of the house and the bottom of the house at the same time. And it's causing companies real problems. Now, the other thing that's changing is these new generations want something different than the millennials or even than the Gen Xers. And this really surprises people. Because most people think, oh, these kids today have no commitment. These kids today have no staying power. They just want the stock options and they want to get promoted. And you know, if I don't promote them every five minutes, they tell me they're going to leave. And they want a performance review every day, right? <laughs> and they want the trophy just for showing up, right? The, the Gen Zs, demographically and psychographically, are different. This generation came of age at a very difficult time. Most of them were born at the time around September 11th or after. They've dealt with government instabilities, they've dealt with floods, they've dealt with hurricanes, they've dealt with a lot. And psychologically, they are of the same value system as their great grandparents who were that silent generation that came of age, also in a time of great turmoil. And what this generation wants, here's this generation that texts instead of talks, and uses five screens at once, and knows they're going to have 14 jobs by the time they're 40, and half of them are freelancers. All this generation wants is security. They want certainty, and they want purpose. Because look at their top three reasons for joining companies. Health insurance is the number one reason they're joining companies. When I got out of school, every company in the world offered health insurance. You didn't pick a company based on health insurance. Today, it's the number one answer. Second, salary, not stock options, not a big bonus, right? They want a competitive base salary that is secure. And number three, they want a boss they can respect. Morals and integrity and values are back. And this generation, wants it. Again, they are similar 
to that silent generation that came of age around World War II, like their great grandparents. And the problem is, a lot of great companies that offer all this stuff don't realize this is what they should be talking about, right? Most companies offer health insurance, most offer good salary, most actually offer leadership with values and purpose. And companies have to understand when they ask me, the number one question I get asked by CEOs is what do I do about all these millennials who are getting out of college today? What do I do with these people? I say, well, the first thing is you've got to recognize they're not millennials. They're Generation Z, and they want something different, and, and here's what it is. And we just have to recognize that we actually have a lot of great things for them already. But here's the rub. The percent of kids entering school today who are going to end up in jobs that don't exist yet is an astronomical two-thirds. So two-thirds of kids entering elementary school today right, are going to be in jobs that don't exist today by the time they get out of school. That's a really scary statistic to someone like me who spends a lot of time thinking about the future and spends a lot of time helping companies think about what kind of work people are going to be doing. Because these kids are going to be doing things we literally have not even imagined yet. And how do we prepare them for that? And so therefore, 85% of jobs that will exist in 2030 haven't even been invented yet. So how do we start training our workforce for that? Reskilling is a big issue facing our country right now. How do we, how do we take that skilling and turn it into reskilling? At the same time, we're back to this principle that, uh, that people call VUCA. I don't know how many people have heard this term VUCA. It was a big term in the 70s and 80s developed by military experts to advise the generals on how to operate in a condition that is volatile, characterized by a rapid rate of change, uncertain in terms of unclarity about future implications, complexity, multiple competing factors and conflicting forces, ambiguity, which is a lack of clarity about how things are going to unfold. That's basically the business world today. Um, and VUCA is back. And the best, the best advice I've heard anybody give, there's this guy, Bob Johansson, who um, leads the Institute for the Future. And I, I've been on the podium with him a couple times. And the advice he gives, which is I think the best advice you can give anybody in today's world, is in business, the kind of strategy that works is to be very clear about where you're going, but very flexible in how you get there. In other words, a lot of people think that this term agility, which is being used today you know, like, like it's water, <laughs> um, that agility means not having a plan. It basically means dynamic, being dynamic, and just being able to handle anything because you don't have a plan. Agility is the opposite. Agility is knowing exactly where you need to be, but being very, very flexible in how you get there. So I know where I'm going. If that road is blocked, I'm going to go to the left. If I can't go to the left, I'm going to go to the right. If I can't go to the right, I go over. If I can't go over, I'm going to go under. And if I can't go under, then I guess I have to bust through. But I have all these scenarios in my head. That is leadership today. Whether you're a CEO, whether you're in finance, marketing, uh, in HR, doesn't matter. Um, that ability to have that kind of flexibility is what is allowing companies to succeed today in this crazy market. At the same time, it's recognizing this generational shift that I talked about and this math problem of the baby boomers being these huge numbers, 80 million people retiring quicker than, than you can keep up, followed by Generation Xers, much smaller generation, a third of whom dropped out of the traditional workforce because they came of age in 87, 92, 95. They did their own startups, so they're gone. Gen, Gen Y, the millennials, huge generation, coming up not ready for these senior leadership roles necessarily across the board, although the earliest ones are, have very different expectations about work and have reshaped companies a little bit. And then you get to Generation Z, which is another tiny generation. And you know, Generation Z, and I'm not just saying this because my kids are Zs and this is an advertisement, but but you know, Gen Z, the ones in the workforce today, the ones who are out of high school and college, working for companies, working for retail, fast food, um, are perceived as being the, the most mature, responsible, accountable employees that companies have had in about 25 years. So a lot of people are saying, well, let's just go to them. Problem is a lot of them are still in the third grade. And so how do we deal with these next five years where all this wisdom from the baby boomers that we so desperately need 
and its context, right, as well as the content, it's walking out the door faster than we can collect it. Gen X, a tiny generation, very qualified, but there just aren't enough of them. Millennials, who are coming through the pipe at a huge rate, wanting fundamentally a different deal, um, and in many ways a deal that has a lot to do with purpose and values and collaboration, followed again by the tiny Gen X. How do we create companies where we can really take all those different forces and really make them sing? Well, I'll give you a couple secrets for what companies are doing that maybe help us out a little bit. First, we're, companies are acknowledging that this thing we're calling the Uberization of work is happening. A few of us were talking about this this morning. I, if, I'm a, if I'm a computer coder, if I'm a, you know, if I'm a, a C++ you know, computer coder, I can go on my phone onto an app through Top Coder or Upwork, and I can actually plug in, here's my skills, I'm looking for an hour of work, and I'm looking for it for 50 bucks an hour, what do you got for me? There's some company on the other end that's gonna flag me and say, yeah, we need you to do this thing today. I can do it for a week, I can say I wanna make $30,000, I can do it for a year, I can get benefits from this thing, I can get healthcare, retirement, I can get community, right? And so that's not all jobs, it's hardly all jobs, it's technical jobs, it's work that comes in fits and spurts, it's not about the context or your customers, but there are now a million people or more on each of those platforms, and the number's going up. The companies that are doing great in this environment are not fighting this. They're not fighting this at all. They're saying, this is great. We're going to decide what kind of work this can be. We're going to figure out how to fill in the spots, and we're going to encourage this in our companies. You know, we're not, we're not going to be afraid of it. We're going to move into it with full force. They know that the cost of robots is coming down every year, right? This is the adoption life cycle of robots. This is a crazy colleague of mine in China trying to give a robot money. The robot isn't ready to take the money yet. But robots can do so many different tasks today. It's trying to keep up with it. And it's acknowledging that our future workers are going to come from a lot of different sources. They're going to be traditional employees. They're also going to be those from outsourcing companies, free agents, alliances, talent platforms, volunteers, robots, and artificial intelligence. So it's how do we proactively deal with this? Instead of hiding from it and saying this too shall pass because it's not going to pass, how do we incorporate it into our companies in a way that is meaningful and ultimately profitable, knowing that there's all kinds of new skills out there? Believe it or not, these five jobs that you see behind me are all real jobs from our clients. Uh, and these are things that exist today. An artificial intelligence ethics evaluator, right? Anyone have one of those? A robot trainer. There's, there's more than three million robot trainers already now in the US. A virtual cultural architect. I still don't know what that person does, but it sounds like a really hard job. A data, talent, and artificial intelligence integrator. Um, I've actually met one of those, very talented guy. And a cyber ecosystem designer. It's basically a cyber security whiz. And you know, there, there are thousands, tens of thousands of those already. Fascinatingly, the top 10 skills that are going to be in demand by employers by 2020 are, there's a lot of things there that are sort of traditional to us. Cognitive flexibility, negotiation skills, service orientation, right? These are not new topics, but these are the things that the kids are coming out of school today who are technologically savvy. They don't have this stuff, right? That's what we in this room all have. You don't get in this room without being able to do that stuff. So how do we take it as a society, a workforce that's focused on the tech, and give them the contextual skills to actually deal with other human beings. That's the magic of the next 20 years. Everybody thinks it's about, gosh, how do we run to STEM? We gotta run to STEM, but let me tell you a story. My older son loves STEM. This kid, has been, this kid came out of the womb doing computers. He's just a genius. And people from our company actually call him for help, no joke, right? So he's in his, he's in his AP physics class in high school, he's a junior in high school, and his teacher takes them aside and says, all right, class, I know you guys are going to start looking at colleges. I want you all to start looking at the liberal arts. And these kids look at him just like deer in the headlights, saying, what are you talking about liberal arts? We've dedicated our lives to STEM, to technology, to computers. 
He's like, you know, I realize every kid of your generation is going to know STEM by the time you guys get out of school, but none of them are going to know how to read or write or communicate. None of them. And if you know STEM, you've got to know STEM, but if you know STEM and you can also do all those other things, I guarantee you a job for life. And these kids are like, how do you know this? And he's like, I read your lab reports, right? <laughs> these are genius kids who can't communicate. So we somehow, here's the name of the game, we somehow, in cities like Birmingham, which are really going tech, we gotta go after the tech, but we can't forget what got us here. Because what got us here are some pretty fundamental human <coughs> skills that need to be combined with the technology for us to be successful, because the number one skill required in the new world, yes, it is digital, okay, it is digital. Digital business skills, ability to work virtually, etc. Agile thinking is the second skill. I never had that in high school, right? But the ability to consider and prepare for multiple scenarios and innovate, deal with complexity and ambiguity, managing paradoxes, balancing opposing views, that's also a critical skill. But guess what number three is? Interpersonal and communication skills. I guess I gotta talk to my kids about talking after all, right, and communicating. And then global skills as well. Those four things are the nexus point of success in the next 20 years, and if we can take those technical skills and build onto them those contextual, those human skills, that's how we really make this thing sing, because one third of US workers are gonna be jobless by 2030 due to automation, according to a McKinsey study. And maybe you say that number's too high, maybe it's 25, 20, fine, still too many. Maybe you think it's low, maybe it's half, doesn't matter. The best thing we can do to equip our workforces is to skill and reskill and to get out of this endless cycle we've been in really for my whole career um, where what we do is we, re we skill people up and then we lay them off, right? So we spend all this money hiring them, we spend all this money training them, we spend all this money teaching them about our company, all of our secrets, and then we lay them off because their skills aren't rele relevant anymore. We spend hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars. What if instead of doing that, we retrained them? What if we did what we did 40 years ago when people had lifetime employment, when we had a worker who job was obsolete, we retrained them to do something else, right? I believe if we can get back into that mindset, get back into that mentality, um, we're gonna be way ahead of the game relative to where we are if we stay in this cycle. And, and your organizations really have an opportunity to invest in reskilling. Um, and, and employees prefer it too. 44% of employees believe their, you know, their companies are getting their career development right. So we have half our workforce today that is a little bit disenfranchised and wants a change. And so we're in a unique opportunity to do it. Just as long as they know career paths are not linear. Career paths just don't go up anymore. We have companies giving what we call horizontal promotion. There's no room at the top, but we'll promote you for taking a job where you're gonna learn and grow on the left. We're gonna give you a promotion to learn and grow in a job where you're gonna to go to the right. And it's our partnership so that we skill you and that you contribute and you stay. And ultimately, we look for leadership that is purpose-driven. We spend a lot of time today talking about purpose. Again, what do generations want? They want purpose, they want certainty. So our leaders have to be agile and adapting to uncertainty willing to challenge the status quo, have a tolerance for risk or failure, be comfortable with vulnerability, be bold with authenticity, recognize, empathize, and respect, which are words that we take quite seriously, and to inspire, impact, and lead with purpose. And the leaders who do this, we believe, are over, able to overcome these challenges. And it's all about linking purpose, well-being, and ultimately, the dignity of our workforce. So other than that, it's pretty quiet out there. There's not a lot going on. And it's just another year. But there's a lot of trends. And it's tough to get through them in 25 minutes, but I had some good fried chicken, so I was ready for it. Um, we have time, for, I think, for a couple questions. So if anybody has any questions, um, shout them out. I'll try to give you some answers. Yeah, sir. So how does uh, traditional education change or what Yeah, the question was, what are my thoughts on how traditional education should change 
in order to meet some of these demands? You know, it's, it's a great question, and it's really interesting, because the great challenge with education is, you know, education really goes for the long term, which is good, but it takes a long time to change. And there are three tenets in education that we're seeing are useful right now. One of them is something that people kind of stop talking about, which is vocation, vocational or technical education. You know, a lot of people have been asking lately, with, especially with the cost of college going up so much, are we better off supplementing traditional college education with vocational and technical training that can at least give people a head start? It's not like the old days. A lot of people don't like vocational education because they say, well, wait a minute, you know, it used to be I teach you to be a lathe operator, and you could be a lathe operator for 50 years, right? Kind of put you out there in the workforce, you did that forever. I can even teach you computer programming, you could do it for 30 years. I'm teaching you a skill you're only going to use for 10 now, right? I'm okay with that. I'd rather have, I'd rather have a kid have a skill for 10 years, come into a company, learn something, get reskilled, than to not have that shot at all. So that's one trend, that's one important trend. The second trend is having company and school partnerships. Um, I, was with a, I was with a company in South Carolina that's a power generation company. They can't get line operators. They pay these people $62,000 out of high school and they can't, they can't hire them, right? And because nobody wants to be a line operator. They don't want to go out in the ice and the snow and the cold and you know, have to be up there. It's not a pleasant job, right? But what this, what this power generator has done is they partner with a local community college to develop a supply of line generators. It's work great. It happens all over, though. It's not just um, the traditional trades. Many of you have read Kaiser Permanente just opened the medical school, right, where they'll, give you, they'll, they'll make you a doctor or a nurse if you agree to work for the company for 10 years. It's like the military, right? So partnerships between companies and schools are a big deal. And then third and final, and then I'll have some other questions. Third and final is we also, I think, have to just be realistic um, about how we can train for technical things versus contextual things. Certain things like leadership and agility are really hard to train for, and that's where it's more about experience in the company than the education itself. Yeah, question, so way in back, have, have yeah, yeah. Sure, go ahead. Could you comment on uh, gender diversification? Uh, there are two primary liberal arts colleges in Birmingham. <clears throat> Sanford University now has an undergraduate population that is 60% female, Birmingham Southern about 54%. So, what trends do you see between male and female going forward? Yeah, great question. And, you know, there's a, I have a lot of slides on, on gender diversity. Two comments on it. Number one, clearly what we're finding is any kind of broadening of the workforce is looked at as a positive in terms of you know, economic correlations. We have all this data basically showing the higher representation of females um, and other underrepresented groups, the higher the profitability of the company. It's a pretty, it's a pretty straight line and you know, some pretty, in my mind, I've seen it done by both believers and non-believers in these trends and the data are coming out almost the same. Um, and what I'm finding is from an inclusion perspective, um, it is important to that, that balance. We're actually seeing more females in traditional colleges today because there's a lot of catching up to do. But also, my comment about vocational education, a lot of males are going into more vocational programs to learn you know, specific skills. So to your point, I think it is about balance. And I think we're seeing the more balance we can have, the, the greater the financial results of the companies that are involved. Yes, sir? Something that seems kind of uh, frightening is, is that uh, you, you talk about how uh, the new workforce coming up like security and this kind yeah. of stuff. And I read about how fewer and fewer people are going into education. Yeah. And schools are not security or the pay is not what it should be and the teachers are on strike. So how do you get more people to go into education? It's tough because it's real tough. And you know my, my wife is a my wife is a fifth generation primary school teacher. And you know she asks herself sometimes when she go into it, right? And um, and you know, I think education is tough because the economics are tough. You know, it used to be when we lived in small towns and neighborhoods and cities, you could be a teacher locally, there was a place for you to live, you could live in the community, you could send your kids to the school, you'd be part of the community. It's just not like that for a lot of teachers anymore. And so 
uh, economically, people say we have a problem to solve in terms of just making it not lucrative. Most teachers I know don't need to make a fortune, but they need to be able to eat and live and such. And so somehow we got to deal with the economic issues. And I don't have an answer for that today. That's another speech. But uh, we got to deal with the answers. And then secondly, we got to make it attractive for people again. And you know, I talked earlier about tying things to purpose. Teaching has a very strong purpose to it. And I, I think somehow we stopped selling that. And I think we need to start making that part of it. Yeah, sir. Um, in let's say 1980, the, yeah. the internet or World Wide Web as we know it was was not born until somewhere around what 1991. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think any of us, not named John Raymond, could conceive of it <laughs> as it is today. So with that in mind, as you squint your eyes, what what would you say 30 years from now will be the most unexpected or uh, inconceivable thing that impacts our workplace? Yeah, no, it's a great question, and you know it's interesting and. Glad you asked. Um, one of actually one of my college roommates is a professor in innovation, and he he walked into he actually walked into the bathroom of our suite. I'll never forget this. In 1984, and he looked at me and he said, "The largest retailer in the U.S. in the year 2000 isn't going to have a single store." And I looked at him and I said, "You're out of your mind." So we really got to ask him, not me. But um, I, I would have believed, and he was wrong. It was actually not till '05, but that's another story. So um, I think I'm going to give you I'm going to give you a double answer. The first answer is, believe it or not, I and I believe it. Or not, I I heard Henry Kissinger speak on this a few years ago, and I didn't think he knew a lot about business. But his premise, which I really have done a lot of research on is he, so he because he is not a web techie savvy kind of guy, he basically suggested, and again, the research supports this, that to, in, in, today there's an abundance of data. Like when he was growing up, it's impossible to get your hand on books, right? Books were this luxury. So when you got a book, you'd imprint it onto your head and into your brain and just try to remember it. And a word would become a concept, a concept would become a sentence, a sentence would become a theory, a theory would become truth. And if you were really, really lucky in life, through a lifetime of experience, that would all translate into wisdom, right? Today, we have an abundance of data. We have so much data that the term curate, anytime I hear about curating data, it's like the new term of the day, right? Curating data is all about sifting through the data to make it that it's not just this massive uselessness, right? Well, through all this data curation, data has become cheap. Ideas have become cheap. Wisdom has become even more rare. And so when I look 30 years from now, anybody who is able to have wisdom about anything <coughs> is going to be of tremendous value to society. And we may convey wisdom differently. We may store wisdom differently. But today, I would argue, every walk of life, we could use a little more wisdom. And 30 years from now, I'm t I tell my kids this all the time, 30 years from now, anything with wisdom is going to be the thing. If you want to look at it a little more tangibly, and you want to look at it sort of as business trends, I actually think when you're looking at things like technologies, um, and you're looking at things like efficiency and sustainability, I think what the people are going to be looking for at that point is any technology that can be recurring, self-generating, if you will, this is what people are talking about now, anything that's self-generating, that you don't have to replace every three years, that you don't have to service, that you don't have to invest in, it doesn't matter what it is. That is going to be the thing. So people are talking about this in medical devices, right, the pacemaker. Not, it's not that it doesn't go out, but it, it can fix itself, right? You don't need surgery for it. Drug delivery that can be regenerated, all these kinds of things. So, Self-regeneration, believe it or not, is the thing that the people are talking about that no one's talking about yet. We'll see if they're right. I'll come back in a couple of years and we'll see if they're right or not. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. Yeah. Uh, on, the, uh, on the physical space, uh, what about open floor plan concepts and how that might play into different generations? Excellent question. And so, you know, we're seeing a res we're seeing a surgence of this right now. I have a big client who's a big real estate you know, firm. And companies are really rushing into this physical space thing because the younger generation love it. And in fact, we, we went to this in the office I'm in. Um, you know, we have, three, we have three floors of the Willis Tower in Chicago. And it's open workspace. I walked in the first day, the, the, the younger workers loved it. High tech, open, social, it was great. 
People have been around a little bit, didn't like it. It was almost perfectly correlated, right, with how long you've been around. I think that it's here to stay because as I found out from my clients, from this real estate company I work with, as well as my own experience, it does lead to a certain kind of productivity around um, the context, the social, the interaction, the leadership, the visibility, the camaraderie. It is phenomenal for all of that. It's also phenomenal from a cost perspective because um, the cost per square foot is lower. I was against moving to the open environment. I gotta be honest with you, here I am, Mr. Future, and I didn't wanna, I didn't wanna lose my office. I like my office, I like the pictures of my kids on the desk. And um, our head of facilities, is a pretty smart guy, came in one day, he said, guess what asset in our company is utilized 2.3%? And I said, all right, I give. He's like, your office. <laughs> said, wait a minute, I'm in the office at least once a week, so maybe I'm not there every week. I'll, I'll, I'll handicap you at 17. He's like, we've been watching you. <laughs> you come into the office, you drop your briefcase, and then you go to a conference room. And then you go to another conference room. And then you come in to check your email for five minutes, and then you go to lunch. And then you come back, and then you go to another conference room, and then you come back. We're basically paying 40 bucks a square foot so you can keep your briefcase in a nice office. <laughs> How do you feel about a locker? <laughs> yeah, that's why I got a locker. But truth be told, financially, um, financially it also is making sense. And by the way, when my kids came, it's a, like half locker. They asked me when I get a high school locker. Do your high school locker? And then the third thing, though, is I do think that some of the early adopters like us, we found people still do need some private space. There are phone calls I take, I cannot take in an open work environment. We have meetings and stuff. So I think what we'll see is a little bit of a snapping back to having more team rooms, private offices for people who need them. But I think we're, I think we're on a trajectory that's probably here to stay. You know, London, in London, where real estate is so expensive in Hong Kong, they've been doing this for 20 years. So I think that as space becomes more of a, you know, more of a precious commodity, um, we'll be seeing more of it. And then last question, this gentleman's been trying to ask questions for the whole time, same. Uh oh, I'm thinking about leadership and yeah. the development of leadership uh, and at each stage and how we determine, determine who among the younger leaders do we want to move up? Yeah. And, and, and train for that in this environment uh, if they're all just doing this and the other and not even, you know, they may do it for nine months and then go away. Right. It's hard. It's real hard. So, you know, it's a good way to wrap up because what all the experts in leadership development are saying, the traits of leadership, the fundamental human traits of leadership that are true today were true a hundred years ago and a thousand years ago. The ability to be authentic and empathetic and tough and nurturing and tough and caring at the same time and thinking beyond yourself and thinking about the greater good, those leadership characteristics are not new. I mean, those leadership you know, characteristics are in some of the oldest written texts in the world, right? And they're just as true today, but they've adapted because now you also need this agility thing. That's new, right? You need to be able to handle this VUCA thing that I talked about. You need to be able to communicate with people on text, right? I, there was a leader of a big insurance company I worked with who was asked to lead one of the highest star young employees that they had, and it was a total clash, total clash. They couldn't talk to each other. They resented each other. She said, oh, she never returns my voicemails. So we talked to this younger woman, and she's like, what's voicemail? <laughs> and this woman said, I've left you a message every day. What do you think that red light is on your phone? I never look at my phone, and I, the red light's always there. She <laughs> left a message to this woman every day, so this woman is like, no woman. Why didn't you send me an email? Well, I don't have to send people email. Like, so part of it is also this adaptation of how we can all learn to exist in this new world. And after they learned to text each other, like they should show around a text, they all got along great. And you know, the grandkids loved it too, like everybody loved it. That created this fantastic moment where we're adopting to new leadership. And then final, you know, final piece of that is what do you do with people moving around so much? How do you know who to invest in? That one's tough. I was with a big company last week who have just 
give it, it's not they give it up, like, you know, we don't focus on retention anymore. We focus on engagement. We focus on making people as productive as they can be while they are here because we know people have so many opportunities. And we were so heartbroken every time anybody lost, left today. We have to just acknowledge some people are going to go. It's the nature of our world. How do we engage people when they're here? Have people teach others the skills they need and the context they need for when they leave? And then hope this core group we're going to just put a wall around will stay for the duration because they'll be engaged on purpose. So it's taken those old, almost biblical skills, applying them to the modern age through technology and the new skills, and then focusing on engaging people when they're here rather than expecting them to stay for their lifetime. And that is the name of the game. And I hope to come back for more fried chicken someday and find out how it all went. So thank you very much. I won't go, uh, I've already promoted the programs. You got the bookmark here, Tim Vines next week, Sally Crawcheck the week after. We won't be here spring break week, so you can take that off and go to Balkan, right, Darling? Uh, and then David Walker, John Turner, uh, et cetera. So lots of good programs coming up. Look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks for being here today. We are adjourned.